An estimated 15 million people in the UK live with long-term conditions such as diabetes, dementia, physical disabilities and mental health problems. They often have a complex mixture of health and social care needs that could benefit greatly from a more integrated approach. The Health and Social Care Act places much of the responsibility for improving such integration with GP-led clinical commissioning groups. It's an opportunity for clinical commissioners to take a more holistic view of people in their lives. Will they take it? The difference between general practice medicine and, let's say, social work is still enormous. And crossing that gap, that culture gap in the work environment, is, is really difficult to do and to sustain. Primary care-led commissioning, clinical-led commissioning is actually rooted in the individual, as is local authority commissioning. And traditionally, health has tended to commission for very large populations and not necessarily thought about that in terms of individuals, particularly people with longer-term conditions. And we have already started to see some examples of groups of GPs and local clinicians sitting down and having a much stronger understanding of how an individual doesn't fit within an acute service or a mental health service or a community service, but actually crosses all those parts of the system. And primary care practitioners tend to understand that. GPs traditionally have always been quite a hard group to engage with because they have functioned largely as self-employed contractors in the, in the health service. Clinical commissioning groups, I think, bring GPs into um, a kind of an organisational fold that will mean that they, uh, they will be more engaged. And I think we're starting to see signs of GPs getting involved in clinical commissioning groups, getting involved in looking beyond uh, the traditional sort of individual patient approach, the individual that's sitting in front of them, and thinking about the broader needs of the communities they serve. I think we've got an opportunity to make some real quantum changes in long-term conditions care over the next couple of years. There is a great deal of uh, passion to improve it. People with long-term conditions have a lot of unmet need at the moment and an awful lot of gaps and duplication in the system. And clinically-led commissioning groups are already grappling with the questions about how they could do a better job for their patients. Academic and campaigner Peter Beresford runs Shaping Our Lives, which gives a voice to users of health and social care services. He brings personal experience to his work. Speaking for myself, as someone with long-term use of mental health services as my background, it's really only been retrospectively that I've come to understand what it was like at the time. You, you realise, looking back on yourself, that all the things you might normally do, like read a book, look on the internet, get some advice about what's happening to you, you're kind of significantly incapacitated to do. Uh, you, your life is in a turmoil. That's true for me as a mental health service user. I think it's true uh, if you become frail as you get older, uh, if you acquire a physical impairment, if you have a child uh, that has learning difficulties. There are seriously incapacitating things around this. We need some guidance, we need some advocacy, we need some information in meaningful ways that we can access, which usually comes from a personal relationship. Such personal guidance can be found in those GP practices that already take an integrated approach to health and social care services. A leading example is the Bromley by Vaux Centre in East London, where Dr Joe Hall is one of the long-serving GPs. Essentially, there's two organisations working in the same building here. There's the GP partnership and there's the Bromley by Centre. There's a lot of crossover in the kind of work that both organisations do for the health of the general community. We have a joint reception for the centre and the surgery and the GP clinicians can refer to all the services available in the centre. We obviously deal with m medical conditions day in, day out. However, we can only take those patients so far dealing with their medical problems. They often have um, social issues that need to deal with, housing issues that need to be dealt with and other issues that are blocking them from actually moving forward in their health. So. To be able to say to someone that I can help you with those things, rather than say, "I'm sorry, I don't. I'm a just. I'm just a clinician. I can only, I can only give you advice around clinical areas," is a huge benefit for us. It relieves the pressure, particularly in a really busy in a city practice with all those social problems. But also, we're helping the patient. Someone who's benefited from this approach is Lisa Cunningham, a former patient. She now runs the centre's pollen project. We run various workshops based around horticulture. Uh, the main focus of the group is uh, 
looking after a flower cutting garden and um, allotment beds that I'm sitting in at the moment. And they are for people who are experiencing mental distress, which is sort of an umbrella term for anxiety and lacking in confidence, um, people that are socially isolated. Before becoming Pollen's project coordinator, Lisa had been referred to one of the centre's seed projects by her GP, having been bullied at work for seven years and signed off sick. My GP referred me to the Bromley by Bow Centre in early 2007, and I had been unwell with depression for 10 years at that point. It just coincided with my then manager wanting to set up a, a flower cutting garden. I volunteered for two hours a week which was all I could manage. I was always late because it was in the morning and I just could never get up in time. And I'd go home and I'd sleep in the afternoon. But by the end of the first year, I was being paid for 17 hours a week and I had stopped taking antidepressants that I'd been on for 10 years and 11 months at that point. Here I am working full time through two different funding streams at the centre. In Tower Hamlets, GP's now working in networks. So working with the local other practices, we are able to send some of the initiatives we deliver here elsewhere so at another practice on the other, the other side of the network we have the team for the welfare and benefits advisors. I think as a network we do work very close with the communities so we're always getting feedback. When people are referred to my project I'm always surprised about the lack of sort of integrated systems that, um, that there are available to people. I think that um, that they're probably lucky to have been referred to us in one sense, that we are able to offer that kind of joined up approach to, towards people's social care needs. Um, but I think that it's not, it's not common for GPs to think about people in a holistic way uh, or in a non-medical way. Existing examples of integrated health and social care aren't restricted to urban practices. In rural Norfolk, the North Elmham surgery has arrived at its own version of integration by a very different route. In 2003-2004, we were one of the highest referring practices in Norfolk and we asked one of the public health doctors to come and see us and they demonstrated this to us and we wondered whether we were weird or right or weird or wrong and we began to look at our uh, admissions to, as emergency admissions to hospital every Wednesday and we'd all sit down and we'd look at the admissions and see whether there was another pathway we could have gone down and more importantly what happened to the patient after they went into the hospital and we began to recognise that there was a, a pattern developing where elderly, frail, vulnerable patients did very badly in hospital and it was possible that they didn't need to go into hospital at all in the first place. A surprise to us was that it wasn't to do with medicine. It wasn't what the GPs were doing. It was what was going on in patients' homes and the kind of social issues that they were facing and the lack of um, uh, an all-encompassing um, pathway that enabled us to support those patients in a different way. So we went to see the chief executive of uh, Norfolk Social Services and he agreed to that a social worker locally would be detailed off to us uh, to meet with us on a Wednesday and to be the practice's social worker. Having resolved that issue, we then learnt more about what patients' needs were. We began to understand dementia better. We then added on the work that we can do with a dementia nurse. We began to understand better the role of other people within the family. And so our team that started off quite small with a nurse, a social worker and the GP has expanded and I don't think we'll stop now. Every Wednesday it's a working lunch for the wider team as they share concerns and discuss support strategies for patients with long-term conditions. The patient who in the past would have been seen possibly by all these people, but all these people wouldn't necessarily have known or spoken to each other, they now all speak to each other and, we, and they get a better standard of care and it does work. We are now one of the lowest referring practices in Norfolk. Is there any possibility of getting a telephone line in there? It might be mobile, but then they may not get reception. No, they, they haven't got reception. No, you, I had to, you've got to stand in a field. He, he phones by wandering up the road for about 150 mm. yards and then standing in a windswept field to get... Mm. Is there anything... Can we get a landline in there? Oh, we could put it into it, but I'd imagine it'd be quite expensive down there, completely isolated to get a fit. Because if there's phone already there, then it's going yeah. to be moved. Depends how far away that is, but we can look at it. Do we? We are a very local 
practice with a very clear identity um, in who we serve and the needs of our patient population. I don't think that prohibits this kind of model moving to other areas. It, 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 we thought we wouldn't be able to do it because we are so rural. The model we'd based it on was, a, was one in a town in, in Cheshire. Um, and we thought that was going to be a challenge, but actually, even in a rural community, it works, and we've got good, solid buy-in from the community teams, the social workers, and our patient population. We have two patient groups that have been in business for the last 10 years, and so we've used them to bounce ideas off and to look at how we're doing it. And to start with, they were kind of cynical that we would never be able to talk to social workers. Having done it, they're really supportive and, and have given us feedback on where we could go next. Alan McKim was one of those sceptical patients who, at the time, was chairman of the Practices Patients Group. We just talked with each other, that is, the uh, uh, various partners and the patient group at our two monthly meetings. The patient group wasn't alone in discovering what was actually coming out of the practice here. It was quickly taken up by the primary care trust, and there were people there who recognised that plans that were coming out of, out of this neck of the woods were something that were really worth following. The practice's present concern is that their successful integration model survives the changes contained in the Health and Social Care Act. A key figure in achieving this is Mark Burgess. Formerly project manager for integrating care in Norfolk, he is now chief officer for Mid-Norfolk Clinical Commissioning. Uncertainty is never a good thing when you're trying to maintain and deliver good service. So that's one of the risks, you know, making sure that everyone has the eye on the ball here. Uh, I think for us in Mid-Norfolk, the opportunity is that we're still very focused on care for our patients uh, and the individuals. And our approach is being to work with partners, whether that be community health, social care, mental health, to ensure that actually that whole system approach really does uh, infiltrate the work that we're doing as a CCG. Again, very simply put, this is about integrated working is about improved communication, improved levels of trust between different organisations, different professionals. Uh, and I think that works at, uh, at a rural and urban setting. It will be variations on a theme, I think, is uh, the way I choose to describe it. You know, what works here isn't going to work at the heart of Norwich or in the heart of London in the exact format we have it here. But the principle of integrated working is we'll face this together, we'll focus on the individuals, and actually that's, that's the kind of key to it, really. And that's the one element, if we focus on the patients, the individuals, that's the bit that ties us all together in many cases. I'm really pleased to see that integrated care is on your agenda. It seems to be um, top of the policy hit parade at the moment. Integration may be a current buzzword, but its implementation requires the efforts of a very large number of people. I suspect from the work that I've done in various places with GPs is that they would like to know more about social care. I think amongst a lot of GPs now there is an appetite to learn more about how local government works, to know more about social care, what social workers do, um, and how the two services can work more closely uh, together. I think there's a real hunger for that in a way that there hasn't been in, in, in previous years. What's going on right now is um, work that involves a lot of different um, government departments, education, health, um, social, social security, etc. And therefore, it's really up to the government departments to recognise that and understand that they have to work in a very integrated way to try and sustain models such as this. Because often government departments compete against each other and therefore makes it highly hard for this integrated model on the ground to actually really work. And I think the enemy of meaningful integration is that we have these two absolutely separate sectors. Because health and social care for any individual human being does not work like that. 